Um, you also, the Biden administration also um, paid Iran $6 billion to release five of our, our prisoners, didn't it? Do you believe ultimately, in the tooth fairy? Ultimately, if we cut off those banks, they will no longer be able to make money. So. Do you believe in the Easter Bunny? So, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, um, the, the Biden administration has operated as Iran's best friend, hasn't it? No, I disagree completely, Senator. Well, um, Iran sold Iraq ten bi billion, not million, ten billion dollars worth of electricity, but Iraq couldn't pay them because of our sanctions against against Iran. The Biden administration waived those sanctions, didn't it? Senator, that so that so that Iran could get ten billion dollars. Isn't that a fact? No, Senator, those, those waivers started under the Trump administration. That money is still in Iraq. That money has never been to Tehran. It will never go to Tehran. The first waiver was on July 2023, wasn't it? Senator, I believe those waivers started in 2018. The, the, the first waiver that the Biden administration did was July of 2023, wasn't it? So, Senator, again, I believe the waiver program started in. You didn't. You didn't do. A, you didn't issue a waiver on July of 2023. Senator, the waivers were continued into 2023. And you issued another waiver to uh, get the money to Iran in November of 2023, didn't you? Senator, as I said, that money has never been, will never go to Iran. The money is still in Iraq. The money may be used for humanitarian purposes, but not a dollar of that. And money you is. and you issued another waiver. On March of 2024, not too long ago, that was six weeks after Iran killed three American soldiers. Senator, you gave Iraq permission to give Iran $10 billion, didn't you? No, Senator. As I mentioned, this was something that started in 2018 under the Trump administration. It allowed Iraq to purchase electricity and to store that money in, in Iraq, none of that money to date will ever go to Iran. The money is being held for humanitarian purposes. You're not telling the truth, Mr. Secretary. No disrespect, but that's just not true. Senator Menendez and Senator Scott made the point. We all know, uh, unless you peaked in high school, you know that money is fungible. Um, you also, the Biden administration also um, paid Iran $6 billion to release five of our, our prisoners, didn't it? Senator, again, that money is in Qatar. None of that money has been used. It hasn't been moved. And as I said earlier, while money is fungible in the United States because we care about our people, it's not fungible for the Iranian... So the money's in Qatar? In a bank in Qatar? Yes. Now, what, what, what do you think... Who controls that bank in, in, in Qatar? Those banks are connect, are controlled by those individuals who run that financial institution. I see. So, so if if uh, uh, President Biden says Qatar Bank, don't give this money to Iran, and the Qatar government says give the money to Iran, who do you think the Qatar Bank's going to listen to, Mr. Secretary? So, Senator, those banks in Qatar value greatly their ability to have a relationship right. with the United States because right. that's how they make money. Do you believe in the tooth fairy? Ultimately, if we cut off those banks, they will no longer be able to make money. So, Do you believe in the Easter Bunny? So, Senator, while I understand your point, fundamentally, none of that money has gone to Iran, and that money is not going to go directly to Iran. Now, you did the same thing with Maduro, you meaning the Biden administration. You guys did the same thing with Maduro in Venezuela. You removed all the sanctions on oil and mining, including gold, with Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela, didn't you? So GL 44 and 43 were put in place in Venezuela. 43 has already... Is that a yes? GL 43 has been removed. Yeah, so, you, so you said, okay, Maduro, we're going to remove, remove Maduro, best friends with Iran and Cuba and China and Russia. You, the Biden administration removed the sanctions on oil and, and mining in Venezuela. Senator. And, and the, the, uh, Maduro said, I promise you that I'll hold a free and fair election. And then he put all his opponents in jail. 
And the Biden administration has done nothing, hasn't it, except stand there sucking on its teeth. So, Senator, I want to say again, we provided general licenses. We did not remove the sanctions. The reason we did that was because we did not trust. So what we can do... The sanctions on Maduro's oil are not there, are they? General license 44, which gives permission for the sale of oil, expires on April 17th, which will then put those sanctions back in place. We did not remove the sanctions. The, 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 the problem you folks have is that you want to so quote Socrates in the middle of a bar fight. Iran is not our friend. Venezuela is not our friend. President Biden keeps giving them money to buy weapons to try to kill us. Senator, we Do you not understand that? sanctions on the Iranian regime. We have not allowed a dollar from Qatar or from the Iraqi electricity fund to flow to Iran. We That's just not true. Senator Menendez explained that to you. The money How can you be that obtuse? Senator, as I've said, our goal is to make sure that we take every action to prevent Iran's destabilizing activity in the region. We're going to continue to go after Iran's sale of oil and try and limit their ability as best we can using the tools that you've given us. I'm here before the Senate asking for additional tools that will allow us to continue to do that. You don't use the ones you have. Uh, Senator Vance, Ohio is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to um, Deputy Secretary for being here. Um, I want to ask just a couple of questions about our sanctions regime and potentially, you know, efforts within this body to really ramp up that, that sanctions regime. So. Um, you and I, I believe, discussed uh, last year. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know how the sanctions on Russia after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, what effect they were having on the Russian economy, what effects actually matched our expectations, and what effects didn't match our expectations. Uh, you know, we're we're a little further down the road here. Uh, it's April of 2024. Do, do we have a good sense of? how the Russian economy did in 2023 and how effective the sanctions were or were not at inhibiting Russian growth? We have a better sense now than we did um, earlier this year. And to answer your question, Senator, I think what we have found is that the Russian economy has largely transitioned to a war economy, where all the tools of production have went from building out a diversified economy that was styled for long-term growth to one that is driven by a short-term need to build as many weapons as possible to further their war aims in Ukraine. And what did their GDP grow last year? Do you know? Their GDP, I believe, grew somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% to 2%. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, frankly, at or above some of our European allies. And uh, it, I, I, I really do worry here, and, and I agree with you, that they've transitioned their economy to a war footing. That has its own internal momentum. And one of the things I worry, I know this isn't your area um, of focus, one of the things I worry some of my, my colleagues underappreciate is that that war footing has a certain momentum to it. And we should be trying to arrest that war footing as much as possible, not leaning into it and prolonging this thing. Because I worry that once Russia becomes an economy that only works in a time of war, that actually makes it more likely and um, that they're going to uh, show aggression now and in the future. Um, I, I want to sort of transition, and in, in, in Mr. Secretary, how aware are you of sort of, of the Repo Act, R-E-P-O, that's sort of moving through – uh, this chamber, are you sort of aware broadly with its outline? Yes, I am. Okay. So one of the things that that does, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, because I'm trying to sort of think through uh, my own view on it, but one of the really worrying provisions uh, is that, as I understand it, it would actually freeze the current sanctions regime that we have on Russia in place legally as an act of Congress. And so if a future president or a second Biden term wanted to change that sanctions regime, they would need an act of Congress to do so. Is that correct? I'm not certain of that provision. My understanding is that it gives the president certain authorities. I don't know that it freezes the current regime. Okay. Uh, that's that's my understanding at least, but I think worth having a follow-up conversation, and certainly my staff will follow up as well on that particular topic. Uh, here, here's the thing that I worry about. I imagine that we have different preferences for who wins the next presidential election, uh, Mr. Secretary. But whether it's a President Biden or a President Trump, I think it's really important for the next administration to have diplomatic flexibility to negotiate what will certainly, I think, be an end to the Russia-Ukraine war, whatever end that ultimately takes. I hope to God that it doesn't last another five years. 
And what I worry about with the Repo Act is that we actually, if we are freezing the sanctions regime, we prevent the president from having an important tool at his disposal and actually negotiating a peaceful settlement to that conflict. Uh, let me let me ask just one final question on the Repo Act. Uh, as I understand it, it would give um, it, it, it it would effectively force asset seizure uh, of all Russian assets. And I, I'm wondering, you know, wh- ha- have we done that in a time of peace with a country that we're not directly at war with? Have we ever done something like what the Repo Act envisions? So, Senator, uh, the one thing I am clear of is that my understanding, at least as the Senate version of the Repo Act, gives the president the ability to, doesn't require him sure. to do so. And I think part of the reason for that is because we know that the vast majority of those assets are in Europe and we'd only want to act alongside our European allies if we did something like that. In terms of um, seizing the assets um, against a country that we're not um, engaged in hostility against, I don't know that we have done something like that at this um, at this juncture. In um, at this juncture, yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. Uh, and with that, I, I yield the remainder of my time. Thanks for being here, and thanks for answering my questions. Thank thanks. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will get right to it. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation. Is there any doubt in your mind that the Iranian regime is the largest state sponsor of terrorism um, against the United States and our allies across the globe? None, Senator. None. So when we look at this, you know, I take a step back and kind of it is it's frustrating for me because I see um, this administration take a posture of of appeasement. When I'm looking at it, you look from the decline of the strategy of maximum pressure under the previous administration to kind of where we are now. And I'm thinking if we all agree that 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 Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism, why wouldn't we be using you know every tool in our toolbox to make sure that we prevent them um, from benefiting financially? And so we've seen Iran's oil profits soar um, since January 2021, reaching over 80 billion and counting, and its steel exports have actually increased twofold. So I guess my question is, has the Biden administration's enforcement authorities, have, have your sanctions enforcement authorities been limited at all since you've gotten to Treasury? No, Senator. We've put in place 571 sanctions against the Iranian regime. And I know that we've spoken personally about what's happening with steel, where we've we've sanctioned the top steel producers in Iran. And the steel they're selling today is illicit and illegal. We have to do more and must do more okay. to cut off that illicit um, transaction. But those companies have been sanctioned by us. So let's talk about the steel specifically. What more do you think we could be doing? What tools do you need or um, could could we use at a, at a greater level in order to crack down on that? So, Senator, one of the things we have to do and that we are doing is working closely with the intelligence um, community to find out how they're illicitly selling uh, what is illegal steel at this point mm-hmm. to go after those nodes that are helping them to do that. So um, what you should expect is we're going to continue to take actions there. One of the reasons I'm here, though, is that um, you mentioned oil. And while Iran is selling oil, one of the challenges they're having is getting the money back to Iran, given mm-hmm. what we're doing in the financial sector. The thing that I am worried about is that Iran will increasingly turn from using the formal financial sector to move their assets and increasingly use cryptocurrency because we don't have well, tools. If there. you just look at where you are right here on, so if you look at, you know, we hit Iran's oil, you mentioned the oil exports receipt, they reached a, a five year high last year of 42 billion compared to, if you look at the 2020 number, 7.9 billion. What do you attribute to that, to that difference? One of the things that the Iranians are increasingly doing is they're consistently looking for ways to do everything from ship to ship transfers using the gray fleet using intermediaries to try and sell their oil while we've put in place more than 500 sanctions against iran what we're finding is that the iranian regime given their desperate need for cash is doing things to try and get around our sanctions so we're going to continue to use our sanctions authorities but ultimately um, that is going to continue to make it more costly for Iran to try and get around them, but they're going to continue to try. Are there any kind of given the data points of this past year and it being a high versus where we were in 2020, are there any tools in your toolbox that you're not using to the fullest extent possible? So, Senator, I think the thing that I've asked my team to do is to come back to me and talk about what else we can do. And I think the key for us is 
not only what the United States can do, but how do we build an international coalition, frankly, because one of the things that we benefited from in the past was that it wasn't just the United States acting, but we were acting alongside our allies and partners. And while today we've been able to get uh, in other countries to come alongside actions we've taken against UAVs when it comes to Iran and mm-hmm. some of their military components, we've been less successful in terms of going after their petrochemical industry. So I think part of this is a diplomatic effort to get other countries to join us in taking those actions because what Iran is doing is that they're moving their petrochemical industry into the shadows and they have and they're doing things that have fewer touch points with the U.S. dollar, which is a thing that I can use. So we need to get other. Are there loopholes specifically that they're that they're using with regards to Russia and China that um, that where we where we need to close those? So in terms of the petrochemical industry, they're actually a competitor to Russia because fundamentally they're selling the same thing on the market. So I think they are not working together in this space. I think from my standpoint, we're using the tools that you've given us to try and impact them using our dollar-based tools, but they're often trying to transact in ways using everything from funk companies to other currencies that require us to build a broader coalition. So last thing, I only have a few seconds left. Um, when you look at the switching gears um, at the Corporate Transparency Act for small businesses, what are you doing to ensure small businesses are aware of those new reporting requirements? One of the things I'm personally doing is speaking to small business interest groups and talking to them about what we can do to try and make sure that the small businesses they represent know about the act. And I think one of the things that we would appreciate is working with your offices so that we can go back to your district offices and do presentations about how small businesses can sign up. Fundamentally, what we know is that the vast majority of small businesses throughout our country want to do the right thing, will want to sign up. And by doing that, it allows us to find those Um, illegitimate small businesses that are often creating threats. So I'm happy to work with your office to set up webinars in your district to send people down to your to your states to help make sure your small businesses are aware. But we're launching an all out campaign to make sure that small businesses throughout the country are aware of um, the need to register. Excellent. I just want to make sure that they have that outreach. So look forward to working with you on that. Thank Thank you, you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge, welcome. Thank you. You are probably the least productive member of your district court. Isn't that right? Well, I have not um, considered myself in those terms, um, Senator. Well, let me explain what I mean. Um, You have 125 motions pending that you've declined to decide. Well, Um, well, um, just let me finish. That's more than any other district judge in the entire Seventh Circuit. In fact, you rank seventh highest nationally, do you not? I am not familiar with those statistics, Senator Kennedy. Um, You haven't looked? I did look in, in preparation for this hearing, but I didn't compare myself to others. You haven't seen that you ranked the seventh the worst in the country? in terms of making decisions? You are the first to tell me this. Um, and I think for me, I, I stress the quality of my decision in making. And uh, as I explained, I came on, I was the first um, district judge to come on during this administration. Yeah, but so, did, so were all the others. I mean, um, there've been 68 district judges confirmed in the 117th Congress. In terms of motions pending for more than six months, you rank number three. You all came on at the same time. You all had the same problems with COVID. You're the third worst. You really think of all the other district judges in the Seventh Circuit, you're the one that ought to be promoted based on this record? Senator, this is something that I've discussed with my fellow judges. All, many of us knew judges from- Not you said you'd never looked at these statistics. I, I haven't, these particular statistics, I, have, I am not familiar with. But in terms of new judges, both from the current administration and the former administration, we are quite a collegial um, bunch. And oftentimes talk about the pressures of a new judge and the way reassignments work in our district, which is that you get 
for example, 300 cases. Yes, ma'am, I understand. I'm familiar with yeah. the procedure in federal court. Here's what I'm trying to understand. Why is your record so bad? Well, I don't view it that way, Senator. When I um, look at the quality of my decision making, um, you know, the feedback that I get from parties, um, you, well, you know, of course I, parties are not going to criticize you. They want <laughs> you to rule in their favor. I, I understand, Senator Kennedy. I mean, um, that's just the way it works. Help me understand why you have such an abysmal record in moving cases. I mean, it costs a lot of money to litigate, and people are paying lawyers, and time is money. And and of all the district court judges in your in 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 the Seventh Circuit, you're the worst in terms of moving cases. Why do you think you deserve to be promoted over all of those others? So, Senator, again, I'm, I'm not familiar with the statistics, but I stand by my record and that I give parties what they need. Um, I think, you know, I am regularly in my courtroom. I am regularly issuing decisions. Um, I just came on at a very difficult time where there was a so, backlog so did, in the courts. So did everybody else. Let me ask you, um, you when you were a partner in your law firm, you volunteered to, uh, to, to, uh, to write a brief on behalf of the Brady Center. You wrote the brief, and this is what you said. You volunteered for this. You weren't being paid. Is that right? Uh, this was a pro bono case that one of my partners right. brought in, yes. Um, you said, quote, assault weapons may be banned because they're extraordinarily dangerous and are not appropriate for legitimate self-defense purposes, close quote. T tell me what you meant by assault weapons. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Just to clarify, <laughs> just to clarify there, I was local counsel. Um, our Supreme yeah, but you wrote the brief. Tell I, me what you meant by assault weapons. Senator Kennedy, actually, I, I did not write the brief. Um, the brief was written by... Um, you signed the brief, though, did correct. you? Correct. I signed and the brief. You sign a brief, you're testifying to the court that everything in it is is true, right? Yes. Okay. That, and, and I... So, I, so I, they're your words in terms of the court, right? Well, I, you're, you're correct, Senator Kennedy. Okay. I would never so tell sign... Tell me what you meant by assault weapons. So I, I am not a gun expert, and at the time, that brief, I think, was about but 10 years. you given the court advice about, say, ban assault weapons. What is, I just, you, you told the court you were, you, were, you were an expert. Just tell me what you wanted to ban. Senator, sitting here today, um, as I said, I did not write that brief. I was local counsel. Sign the brief. I understand. At, at the time Tell that, me what you wanted to ban. That's all I'm, I'm going to know, I, Judge. I don't remember the exact definition of assault weapons in the, the ordinance that was at issue. So you submitted a brief to the to, to, to an appellate brief, you signed it, and you don't know what, and you said abolish assault weapons, and you don't know what you wanted them to abolish? Senator, at the time that I signed the brief, I, I read the brief um, because the, our Supreme Court required someone, an Illinois bar member, to sign the brief. I was not responsible for researching the content. You were I, responsible I, I, for the brief. You I, it, absolutely, absolutely. And sitting here today, I do not remember the characteristics of, of that were that were cited in the ordinance for the assault weapons ban. It's not an area of practice that I have um, specialized in. I'm sure if, ten years ago, I re, I would I could have answered your question. And but Judge, sitting here want, today, you, you want you think Senator, you deserve to be promoted. Expired. You're not an asshole, Mark. You're just trying so hard to be. And you and some of your colleagues who are not here have blocked everything we have tried to do in terms of reasonable regulation. Everything from privacy to child exploitation. And um, 
In fact, we, we have a new definition of recession. Um, a recession is when, we know we're in a recession when Google has to lay off 25 members of Congress. That's what we're down to. We're also down to this fact that your platforms are hurting children. I'm not saying they're not doing some good things, but they're hurting children. And I know how to count votes, and if this bill comes to the floor of the United States Senate, it will pass. What we're going to have to do, and I say this with all the respect I can muster, is convince my good friend Senator Schumer to, to go to Amazon, buy a spine online, and bring this bill to the Senate floor. And uh, the House will then pass it. Now, that's, that's one person's opinion. I may be wrong, but I doubt it. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, let me ask you a couple of questions. Let's, I might wax a little philosophical here. Um, I have to hand it to you. Uh, you, you, have, um, you have convinced over 2 billion people to give up all of their personal information, every bit of it, in exchange for getting to see what their high school friends had for dinner Saturday night. That's pretty much your business model, isn't it? It's not how I would characterize it. I and mean, we give people the ability to connect with the people they care about and, um, and to engage with the topics that they care about. And you, and you take this information, this abundance of personal information, and then you develop algorithms to punch people's hot buttons which, and, send, and, and steer to them information that punches their hot buttons again and again and again to keep them coming back and to keep them staying longer. And as a result, your users see only one side of an issue. And so, to some extent, your platform has become a killing field for the truth, hasn't it? I mean, Senator, I disagree with that, that characterization. Um, you know, we build ranking and recommendations because people have a lot of friends and a lot of interests and they want to make sure that they see the content that's relevant to them. Um, we're trying to make a product that's useful to people and, and make our services um, as helpful as possible for people to connect with the people they but, care about and the interests they care about. But and you don't show do. them both sides. You don't give them balanced information. You just keep punching their hot buttons, punching their hot buttons. You don't show them balanced information so people can discern the truth for themselves. And, and you rev them up so much that, that so often your platform and others becomes just cesspools of snark where nobody learns anything, don't they? Well, Senator, I disagree with that. I think people can engage in the things that they're interested in um, and learn quite a bit about those. We have done a, a handful of different experiments and things in the past around news and trying to show content on you know, a diverse set of, of, of perspectives. I think that there's more that needs to be explored there, but I don't think that we can solve that by ourselves. One do, of the things do, that do I you saw- think, I'm sorry to cut you off, Mr. Mr. President, but I'm gonna run out of time. Do, do you think your users really understand what they're giving to you, all of their personal information, and how you, how you process it and how you monetize it. Do you think people really understand? Uh, Senator, I think people understand the basic terms. I mean, I, I think that there's... Let, that, that let me put I, it I actually in, think that a lot of people put it another way. how much information we, We've been a couple of years have. since we talked about this. Does your user agreement still suck? I, I'm, can, I'm not sure you, how to answer that, Senator. Can, can, you, I, still I hide basic, a, can I, you still hide a dead body in all that legalese where nobody can find it? Senator, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to, but I think people get the basic deal of using these services. It's a free service. You're using it to connect with the people you care about. 
if you share something with people, other people will be able to see your information. It's, it's inherently, you know, if you're putting something out there to be shared publicly um, or with a private set of people, it's, you know, you're inherently putting it out there. So I, I think people get that basic I, but, part but, of how the service works. But Mr. Zuckerberg, works. you're in the foothills of creepy. You, you, track, you, track, you track people who aren't even Facebook users. You track your own people, your own users who are your product, even, even when they're not on Facebook. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to land this plane pretty quickly, Mr. Chairman. I, I, just, I mean, it's creepy. And I understand you make a lot of money doing it, but I just wonder if, if our technology is greater than our humanity. I mean, let me ask you this final question. Instagram is harmful to young people, isn't it? Senator, I disagree with that. That's not what the research shows on balance. That doesn't mean that individual people don't have issues and that there aren't things that, that we need to do to, to help provide the right tools for people. But across all of the research that we've done internally, I mean, this, this, the uh, you know, survey that uh, the senator previously cited, um, you know, there are 12 or 15 different categories of harm that we asked um, teens if they felt that Instagram made it worse or better. And across all of them, except for the one that, 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 um, that Senator Hawley cited, um, more people said that using Instagram I, made the issues this that they point, face, Mr. either positive or... Uh, let me, we just have to agree to disagree. If, if you believe that Instagram, I know it's, I'm not saying it's intentional, but if you agree that Instagram, if you think that Instagram is not hurting millions of our young people, particularly young teens, particularly young women, you shouldn't be driving. It is. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Social media is a very powerful tool, but we're here because every parent I know, and I think every parent in America is terrified about the garbage that is directed at our kids. I have two teenagers at home, and the phones they have are portals to predators, to viciousness, to bullying, to self-harm. And each of your companies could do a lot more to prevent it. Mr. Zuckerberg, in June of 2023, the Wall Street Journal reported that Instagram's recommendation systems were actively connecting pedophiles to accounts that were advertising the sale of child sexual abuse material. In many cases, those accounts appeared to be run by underage children themselves, often using code words and emojis to advertise illicit material. In other cases, the accounts included indicia that the victim was being sex trafficked. Now, I know that Instagram has a team that works to prevent the abuse and exploitation of children online. But what was particularly concerning about the Wall Street Journal expose was the degree to which Instagram's own algorithm was promoting the discoverability of victims for pedophiles seeking child abuse material. In other words, this material wasn't just living on the dark corners of Instagram. Instagram was helping pedophiles find it by promoting graphic hashtags, including hashtag ped whore and hashtag preteen sex to potential buyers. Instagram also displayed the following warning screen to individuals who were searching for child abuse material. The these results may contain images of child sexual abuse. And then you gave users two choices. Get resources or see results anyway. Mr. Zuckerberg, what the hell were you thinking? All right, Senator. Um, the, the, the basic science behind that is that when people are searching for something that is problematic, it's often helpful to, rather than just blocking it, to help direct them towards something that, um, that could be helpful for getting them to get help. In, in what, I also, understand get resources. In what sane universe is there a link for see results anyway? 
Well, because we might be wrong. We, we try to trigger this, this uh, warning, or we tried to, um, when we think that there's any chance that the results might be Okay, you might, might be, be wrong. Let me ask you, how many times was this warning screen displayed? I don't know, but the... But the hey, you don't know. Why don't you know? I, I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. But well, the, You know what, Mr. Zuckerberg? It's interesting you say you don't know it off the top of your head, because I asked it in June of 2023 in an overlight, oversight letter, and your company refused to answer. Will you commit right now to within five days answering this question for this committee? We'll follow up on that. Is that a yes? Not a will follow up. I know how lawyers write statements saying we're not going to answer. Will you tell us how many times this warning screen was displayed? Yes or no? Senator, I'll personally look into it. I'm not sure if we have Okay, to so you're that. refusing to answer that. Let me ask you this. How many times did an Instagram user who got this warning that you're seeing images of child sexual abuse, how many times did that user click on see results anyway? I want to see that. Senator, I'm not sure if we stored that, but I'll personally look into this and we'll follow up after. And what follow-up did Instagram do when you have a potential pedophile clicking on, I'd like to see child porn? What did you do next when that happened? Senator, I think that an important piece of context here is that any context that we think is child sexual Mr. Zuckerberg, abuse, that's called a question. What did you do next when someone clicked... You may be getting child sexual abuse images, and they click, see results anyway. What was your next step? You said you might be wrong. Did anyone examine, was it in fact child sexual abuse material? Did anyone report that user? Did anyone go and try to protect that child? What did you do next? Senator, we take down anything that we think is sexual abuse material on the service, and we do Did, did anyone verify to- whether it was in fact child sexual abuse material? Senator, I don't know if, if every single search result we're following up on, but... In, did did but you report the, board, the people who wanted it? Senator, do you want me to answer your question? Yeah, I want you to answer the question I'm asking. Did you report time to speak the people them? who click see results anyway? Uh, that's probably one of the factors that we use in reporting. And in general, I mean, we've reported more people and done more reports like this to NCMEC, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, than any other company in the industry. We proactively go out of our way across our services to do this and have made, I think it's more than 26 million reports, which is more than the whole rest of the industry combined. So Mr. Zuckerberg, the, the, the Mr. Zuckerberg that, that we, your that we company and seriously. every social media company needs to do much more to protect children. All right, Mr. Chu, in the next couple of minutes I have, I want to turn to you. You're familiar with China's 2017 national intelligence law, which states, quote, all organizations and citizens shall support, assist, and cooperate with national intelligence efforts in accordance with the law and shall protect national intelligence work secrets they are aware of. Yes, I'm familiar with this. TikTok is owned by ByteDance. Is ByteDance subject to the law? For the Chinese businesses that ByteDance owns, yes, it will be subject to this, but TikTok is not available in mainland China. And Senator, as we talked about in your office, we built Project Texas to put this out of reach. So, So ByteDance is subject to the law. Now, under this law, which says, shall protect national intelligence work secrets they are aware of, it compels people subject to the law to lie, to protect those secrets. Is that correct? I ca- cannot comment on that. Um, what I said, again, is be- that be- we have Because you have to protect those this. secrets? No, Senator, we, TikTok is not available in mainland China. We have moved the data into but, an American cloud TikTok infrastructure. But TikTok is and- controlled by ByteDance, which is subject to this law. Now, you said earlier, you said, and I wrote this down, we have not been asked for any data by the Chinese government, and we have never provided it. I'm going to tell you, and I told this when you and I met last week in my office, I do not believe you. And I'll tell you, the American people don't either. If you look at what is on TikTok in China, you are promoting to kids science and math videos, educational videos, and you limit the amount of time kids can be on TikTok. In the United States, you are promoting to kids self-harm videos and anti-Israel propaganda. Why is there such a dramatic difference? Senator, that is just not accurate. Uh, There's not a difference between what kids see in China and what kids see here? 
Senator, the TikTok is not available in China. It's a separate experience there. What, what I'm but, saying but is... But you, you have a, a company that is essentially the same, except it promotes beneficial materials instead of harmful materials. That is not true. We have a lot of science and math content here on TikTok. There's so much of it uh, right, created right, a stand feed for okay, 100 let me, let me billion point, let, me point, let me point to this, Mr. Chu. There, there was a report recently uh, that, that compared hashtags on Instagram to hashtags on TikTok. TikTok and what trended, and the differences were striking. So, for something like hashtag Taylor Swift or hashtag Trump, researchers found roughly two Instagram posts for every one on TikTok. That's not a dramatic difference. That difference jumps, jumps to eight to one for the hashtag Uyghur, and it jumps to 30 to one for the hashtag Tibet, and it jumps to 57 to one to the hashtag Tiananmen Square, and it jumps to 174 to 1 for the hashtag Hong Kong protest. Why is it that on Instagram, people can put up a, a hashtag Hong Kong protest 174 times compared to TikTok? What censorship is TikTok doing at the re request of the Chinese government? None. Senator, that analysis, is flawed. That the analysis is flawed. It's been debunked by other external sources like the Cato Institute. Fundamentally, a few things happen here. Not all videos carry hashtags. That's the first thing. The second thing is that you cannot selectively choose a few words within a certain Why time Why the period. difference between Taylor Swift and Tiananmen Square? What happened in Tiananmen Square? Senator, there was a massive protest uh, during, in, in, during that time. But what I'm trying to say is our users can freely come and post Why this Why would there be no difference on Taylor Swift or a minimal difference and a massive difference on Tiananmen Square or Hong Kong? Senator, could you wrap up, please? S Senator, our algorithm does not suppress any content simply based to on this. To answer that doesn't. question, why yeah. is there a difference? Like I said, I think this analysis is flawed. You're selectively choosing some words over some periods. We haven't been around there as long as other apps. There is an obvious difference. 174 to 1 for Hong Kong compared to Taylor Swift is dramatic. And Senator Hawley, you haven't voted yet. <clears throat> You're next. And uh, I, I don't know how long the vote will be open, but I'll turn over to you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, let me start with you. Did I hear you say in your opening statement that there's no link between mental health and social media use? Senator, what I said is I think it's important to look at the science. I know it's people widely talk about this as if that is something that's already been proven. And I think that the bulk of the scientific evidence does not support that. Well, really, let, let me just remind you of some of the science from your own company. Instagram studied the effect of your platform on teenagers. Let me just read you some quotes from the Wall Street Journal's report on this. Company researchers found that Instagram is harmful for a sizable percentage of teenagers, most notably teenage girls. Here's a quote from your own study. Quote, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Here's another quote. Teens blamed Instagram, this is your study, for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. This reaction was unprompted and consistent across all groups. That's your study. Senator, we try to under, understand the, uh, the feedback and, and how people feel about the services. We can improve Wait a minute. Your, own, da your are... own study says that you make life worse for one in three teenage girls, you increase no, Senator, anxiety and says. depression. That's what it says. And you're here that's testifying that's. to us in public that there's no link. You've been doing this for years. That for years, you've been coming in public and testifying under oath that there's absolutely no link. Your product is wonderful. The science is nascent, full speed ahead, while internally, you know full well your product is a disaster for teenagers. Senator, and yet you keep true. right on doing what you're doing, right? That's not true. That's not true. Let me, let, me t let me show you some other but facts I, mean, you, I know you, that you're you familiar carry, you with. I, well, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, I mean, not that's, that's not a question. That's not a question. Those are facts, Mr. Zuckerberg. That's, that's not a not, question. That's, those aren't facts. Here, let me show you some more facts. Here are some, here's some information from a whistleblower who came before the Senate and testified under oath in public. He worked for you. He's a senior executive. Here's what he showed he found when he studied your products. So, for example, this is girls between the ages of 13 and 15 years old. 37% of them reported that they had been exposed to nudity on the platform, unwanted, in the last seven days. 24% said that they had experienced unwanted sexual advances they'd been propositioned in the last seven days. 17% said they had encountered self-harm content pushed at them in the last seven days. 
Now, I know you're familiar with these stats because he sent you an email where he lined it all out. I mean, we've got a copy of it right here. My question is, who did you fire for this? Who got fired because of that? Senator, we study all of this because it's important and we want to improve our services. Well, you just told and me I a second ago that you studied it, but that there was no linkage. Who Senator, did you fire? You, I said you mischaracterized 37 percent of teenage girls between 13 and 15 were exposed to unwanted nudity in a week on Instagram. You knew about it. Who did you fire? Senator, this is why we're building all Who these did you fire? tools. Senator, that's, I don't think that that's... Who did you fire? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Um, because <laughs> I mean, you didn't is, fire anybody, right? You didn't take Senator, any significant I, I don't action. Think it's appropriate to talk about it, it, like it's not appropriate HR decisions. In, in Do you know who's like sitting that? behind you? You've got families from across the nation whose children are either severely harmed or gone, and you don't think it's appropriate to take a, talk about steps that you took? The fact that you didn't fire a I, single person. To, let me I'm ask you this. Let me ask you this. Have you compensated any of the victims? Sorry. Have you compensated any of the victims? I, These I, girls. I, have you compensated them? I don't believe so. You, why not? Don't you think they deserve some compensation for what your platform has done? Help Senator, with counseling services? Help with dealing with the issues that your, your service has caused? Our, our job is to make sure that we build tools to help keep people safe. Are you going to platform. compensate them? Senator, our job and what we take seriously is making sure that we build industry-leading tools to find harmful to content, make money. take it off the services, uh, to make money. and to build tools that empower parents. So you didn't take any people. action. But you didn't take any true, action. Senator. You didn't fire anybody. You haven't that's compensated a that's single not, victim. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I'm, you like to do so now? Well, They're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I, 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 I'm sorry for everything that you've all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. And this is why we invest so much and are going to continue doing industry-leading efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. You know... Why, Mr. Zuckerberg, why should your company not be sued for this? Why is it that you can claim, you hide behind a liability shield, you can't be held accountable? Shouldn't you be held accountable personally? Will you take personal responsibility? Senator, I, I think I've already answered this. I mean, this is, these well, are try this again. issues. Will you take personal responsibility? Senator, I view my job and the job of our company as building the best tools that we can to keep our community safe. Well, you're failing at that. To, well, Senator, we're doing an industry-leading effort. We build AI oh, tools nonsense. that... Oh, Your product is killing people. Will you personally commit to compensating the victims? You're a billionaire. Will you commit to compensating the victims? Will you set up a compensation fund Senator, with your money? I think these are... These are with your money. Senator, these are complicated yes, that, No, that, that's not a complicated I, I, question, though. That's Senator, a yes or no. Will you set up a victim's compensation fund with your money, the money you made on these families sitting behind you? Yes or no? Senator, I don't think that that's uh, my job is to Sounds make sure like that we a no. good tools. My, my Sounds job like is a no. to make sure that we your job is to be responsible for what your company has done. You've made billions of dollars on the people sitting behind them. Are you here? You've done nothing to help them. You've done nothing to compensate them. You've done nothing to put it right. You could do so here today, and you should. You should, Mr. Zuckerberg. Before my time expires, Mr. Chu, let me just ask you your platform. Why should your platform not be banned in the United States of America? You are owned by a Chinese communist company or a company based in China. The editor-in-chief of your parent company is a Communist Party secretary. Your company has been surveilling Americans for years. According to leaked audio from more than 80 internal TikTok meetings, China-based employees of your company have repeatedly accessed non-public data of United States citizens. Your company has tracked journalists improperly gaining access to their IP addresses, user data, in an attempt to identify whether they're writing negative stories about you. Why should, your, your platform is basically an espionage arm for the Chinese Communist Party. Why should you not be banned in the United States of America? Senator, I disagree with your characterization. Many of what you have said, we have explained in a lot of detail. 
TikTok is, is used by 170 million Americans. I know when every single love. one of those Americans are in danger from the fact that you track their keystrokes, you track their app usage, you track their location data, and we know that all of that information can be accessed by Chinese employees who are subject to the dictates of the Chinese Communist Party. That, that why, not, why should you not be banned in this, in this country? Uh, Senator, that is not accurate. A, a lot of what you describe we collect, we don't. And it is 100% accurate. Do you deny that repeatedly Americans' data has been accessed by ByteDance employees in China? Uh, we built a project that you know, cost us billions of dollars to stop that. And we have made a lot of progress. And it I hasn't think. been stopped. According to the Wall Street Journal report from just yesterday, even now, ByteDance workers, without going through official channels, have access to the private information of American citizens. I'm quoting from the article. Private information of American citizens, including their birth date, their IP address, and more. That's now. Senator, as we know, the media doesn't always get it right. What, what we have... What we have uh, but the Chinese what, Communist Party does? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that we have, been, we have spent billions of dollars to build this project. It's rigorous, it's robust, it's unprecedented, and I'm proud of the work that the 2,000 employees are doing to protect the data. It's, it, but it's not, it's not protected. That's the problem, Mr. Chu. It's not protected at all. It's subject to Communist Chinese Party inspection and review. Your app, unlike anybody else sitting here, and, and heaven knows I've got problems with everybody here, but your app, unlike any of those, is subject to the control and inspection of a foreign hostile government that has actively trying to track the information of whereabouts of every American that they get their hands on. Your app ought to be banned in the United States of America for the security of this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all of our witnesses today. Um, professor Sarin, you, you, uh, you're, you're a professor at Yale Law School? I am. Okay. Uh, and you, I see you've been pretty active on Twitter. I'm looking at one of your tweets from a few months ago, October 30th. 2023, I'd like to read it to you. The House Republican stance is, I kid you not, support for Israel as long as we make it easier for people to cheat on their taxes. End quote. Did you tweet that? That's correct, yes. Okay. Um... How many Republican congressmen or women did you talk to before you made that statement? I was reacting to the fact that, and we've talked about it actually yes, so far in this. Yes, ma'am, but first, if you could, how many Republican uh, congresswomen or congressmen did you talk to? I didn't talk to them. I actually was just reacting to the legislation that was proposed. You, didn't talk, to, you didn't talk to any of them? No, sir. Before you said that every single one of them supports Israel only if, if it is made easier for people to cheat on their taxes? I actually don't think that every single one of them believes but that. But that's what but you I, said. But I do think that the legislation passed by the House reflects a statement of purpose that but, in order to support Israel, but, but, it's important but I'm looking to at what you said, allow what taxpayers what your to be able thought. to cheat you on their taxes. You said that every single House Republican, none of whom you talk to, would only support Israel if it was made easier for Americans to cheat on their taxes. Now, you said that, Senator and you didn't Kennedy. talk to any of them. Senator Kennedy, didn't. I, am, I am struck by, and perhaps this is something on which we agree, that it is incredibly important to support Israel. It is also incredibly important to make sure that well, taxpayers at the I'm not, top of I, the I, I can, We agree on Israel, but share. I just can't believe you would say this about members of Congress. It's pretty pejorative, vicious. Let me finish. Without talking to them. I mean, would it be possible for somebody to support a reduction to the IRS budget because they simply believe the federal government ought to have a, a balanced budget? Would that be a fair position? That would would be, that be a principled position? Except that that actually doesn't work with respect to defunding the IRS. But would it IRS. be a principled position? 
it wouldn't be an accurate position because okay. defunding But you don't the know because you didn't talk to anybody, did you? Well, you just said it. Defunding the IRS, the CBO agrees, everyone who's testifying today agrees that well, that is going to add to deficits, could, not could reduce it, them. Could it be that a, a House Republican wanted to reduce the IRS's budget because they think that the IRS is a model of inefficiency and shouldn't be rewarded with more money. Well, Could Senator that have been a possibility, a motivation for the way they Senator voted? Kennedy, I so appreciate that question because the reality Could that have been that a motivation for the way they voted? And it relates very closely to what Senator Could Reed that have said. been a motivation the for the way they voted? That you've seen an inefficient Could that address. have been a motivation for the way they voted? If you allow the, the witness to voted? answer, you might get your answer, Senator it, it Kennedy. It frankly couldn't have been. It could or couldn't? It could not have been. How do you no, you didn't talk to him. Because the reason why you've seen you the just IRS made this statement that, that every every Republican in the House supports Israel only if it, it has been made easier for people to cheat on their taxes. Could it be that maybe a House member thought that well, the more money we spend, the more deficits we have. And the more deficits we have, the more pressure is put on interest rates. And the higher interest rates go, the more it hurts the poor. Well, Could that have been Senator the position Kennedy, of one of the House Republicans? Senator Kennedy, Could it have been, it, theoretically? It couldn't have been. Because Could it, everyone... It couldn't agrees. have been? It, it frankly could How do you know you didn't talk to him? Well, I know that everyone agrees, including witnesses across the aisle, including CBO, including every single tax expert that has contemplated this question, that defunding the IRS makes deficits worse, not better. And so this is a I, deficit measure. I just find it, measure. Professor, appalling. Appalling that you would make a statement like this, a vicious statement like this, without talking to a single person about whom you made this statement. And I'm going to remind you, you know, you, you, you're only, you can only be young once, but you can always be immature. And you ought to think about that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, let me just say that I think that the treatment of witnesses is beginning to degrade a bit here. And um, I'm going to strike some commentary if it continues down this road. I think personal insults to witnesses are not uh, appropriate, and I will not uh, be um, tolerant of that in this committee. Well, could I respond, Mr. Chairman? You, you're going to fire away. I think you just called a. Uh, you, you're going to do what you got to do, sure. but I'm going to continue to use my time. You, you bring witnesses, as you're entitled to, and some of them are very good. Some of them uh, have, 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 uh, have the credibility of Michael Lavinati. And I'm going to use my time when I think it's appropriate to, uh, to and test. I'm to, and if I'm going to use my authority my as shelf, chairman. To test as credibility, I think it is appropriate witnesses' as well credibility. In order so you to do what you got to do, and I'm going to do what I got to do. Good behavior in But if a that Senate is meant to, to, to bully me, you're, you're talking no to the wrong to bully guy. You. Okay. No attempt to bully you, none at all. It's to keep the witness and the committee free of bullying. I'm entitled to test their credibility, and I think we, one of our witnesses just got tested. I hope I passed, Senator. Thank you. You didn't. Senator Johnson. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start at the outset. I'm an accountant. Uh, I value audits. My wife was an IRS auditor. So, you know, we need that. There's no doubt about it, okay? You can argue legitimately, you know, to what extent, how many auditors, you know, how much we should spend on it. That's, that's legitimate uh, conversation. Uh, I, I do have to admit, though, er every time I hear the chairman or the chairman of the finance committee say the word wealthy tax cheat, I think of the name Hunter Biden and all of the Biden family members who have been participating in his influence peddling grifts. I think it's interesting, as much as this hearing is emphasizing on audits, that when Senator Grassley and I were conducting our very legitimate investigation using our constitutional responsibility of oversight, when we were investigating tax cheating, influence peddling, you know, money coming in tens of millions of dollars from foreign entities to impact potentially U.S. policy, Democrat senators, our ranking members, not only frustrated, I would say obstructed 
our investigation by falsely claiming we were soliciting and disseminating Russian disinformation. Now, that just happened to parrot what we've now found out the FBI set up their foreign influence task force, what they were doing in their catch and kill operation, find derogatory information that was being developed by 40 confidential human sources, and then go kill it. Go, go say, oh, that's, don't, don't look into that. Go, don't, don't go down that investigatory hole, because that's Russian disinformation. So the question I have based on that, Professor Saren, it's obvious we have a dual system of justice applied to tax compliance. When somebody is connected politically as Hunter Biden, when his investigatory team allows the statute of limitations to expire on the most serious tax evasion charges, what does that dual system of justice, what does that do in terms of taxpayer compliance? So, Senator Johnson, I actually want to take a step even higher, but with your sort of theme, Quickly, of, please. theme of democracy and heart. In this country today, we have a two-tiered tax system, as you acknowledge. Your constituents who are wage earners are already paying everything that they owe, and a very small proportion of very wealthy individuals and large corporations have the opportunity to oh, Okay, okay, and that's, that was your testimony. Again, I want you to speak to the fact that the president's son is b largely skating because they allowed the statute of limitations to run. What does that do to, to compliance in terms of Americans' attitude toward that, Professor Hendren? 